My name is Joy Tickle. I'm a tissue viability nurse specialist from Shropshire. Today we'll be focusing on how best practice can help us to improve wound assessment in our clinical practice and help with sequent targets. The seminar is supported by BSM Medical and contact information is available at the end of this presentation. We're going to look at best practice and using best practice to improve wound assessment. I'd like to introduce the learning objectives for this evening. The learning objectives are to discuss the health economical burden that wounds impose upon the NHS in the UK, what the burden imposes on health providers and practitioners, and most importantly, that burden of wounds to the patient. We're going to uh, discuss the wound care sequin, uh, the target that was introduced in 27, 2017, and what it means, and introduce the new best practice statement for improving holistic assessment of chronic wounds, and most importantly, showing evidence of that best practice in practice. We're all aware there is a lot of data at the moment around the burden of wounds, the burdens to the patients, to health providers and to practitioners. A lot of that work has been carried out by Julian Guest and other eminent authors. And what the findings suggest is that the NHS treats 2.2 million wounds and worryingly over 30% of those wounds lack to diagnosis. The average cost of treating un unhealed wounds is now averaging £13,500. And we know that two-thirds of patients managed in uh, managed, two-thirds of patients with wounds are managed in the community setting. 10.9 million community nurse visits per annum due to wounds. 18.9 million practice nurse clinic appointments due to managing wounds. And importantly, patients with wounds present with a high number of comorbidities. What the data also suggests is that lack of holistic assessment pertaining to undiagnosed etiology of the wounds, but also undiag undiagnosed assessments. For example, Doppler assessments. 85% of, 85 of patients with an unspecified leg ulcers and only 46% of those patients uh, were in compression therapy. And, and all of those 85% of patients had not, under, had not had an ABPI or Doppler undertaken, which we know is the gold standard uh, att attaining to compression therapy. 95% of patients with diabetic foot ulceration did not receive a Doppler assessment. And we know these patients are at significant high risk of peripheral vascular disease and potential amputation. In addition to this, again, it was down to the lack of etiology and diagnosis of that wound. 40%, 41% of the wounds summarised were not accurately diagnosed. 11% were simply recorded as an open wound. If we don't get a true diagnosis, how can we ensure a true treatment regime or an effective and uh, relevant treatment regime? For instance, a patient with a chronic uh, uh, venous leg ulcer, if it's classed as an open wound or a leg ulcer and the venous disease has not been diagnosed, then lack of compression therapy may occur, resulting in poor management of that patient and patient outcomes. And the cost, as I've just explained, of healing of unhealed wounds is significant. And that 47% of venous leg ulcers are unhealed uh, for as long as 12 months or even longer. So what is needed to improve the clinical outcomes of chronic wounds? We need that full holistic assessment and documentation. Um, we need to assess the patient as a whole, not just the whole that is presenting, i.e. the wound. We need to assess the patient's comorbidities, the environment the patient lives in, the wound, the skin, and other contributing factors. We must ensure their comorbidities are addressed and considered, and most importantly, the patients are involved in the planning of their treatment and clear and appropriate agreed goals set with them to make them realistically, realistic and timely. And using those appropriate assessment tools which I discussed earlier, for example, Doppler assessments, or even just implementing a systemic clinical decision-making tool which can assist practitioners in their management. All staff, however, when we're undertaking a holistic assessment, um, must be involved and have the appropriate knowledge and skills. It is difficult to attend training seminars. I totally respect that in my workplace also. 
difficult to keep abreast of up and coming evidence. But by producing such do documents as the best practice statements, we can do that for you and we can give you the information and evidence and competency frameworks to use in practice. And most importantly, we need to give you time, time to undertake that holistic assessment. Again, time is not something that we have a great deal of in healthcare, but it's something that by allocating time in the first instance can save time in the future. Secondly, I want to discuss the wound care sequin target. The sequin indicator, or the wound care sequin, which is sequin 10, is one of 13 indicators introduced in 2017 to 2019. It's currently only applicable to community settings in England, particularly community nursings. But the goal of the indicator is to increase the number of full wound assessments for, uh, for, full wound assessments for patients for wounds that have failed to heal after four weeks. The sequin will enable service providers to review how, current their, how currently their service is being managed. Is this being undertaken in their areas? It can highlight any strengths or weaknesses and also implement then any relevant changes which are necessary to enable all practitioners to undertake that full wound assessment of all patients who have chronic wounds. Ultimately, that will lead to clinical improvement outcomes for the patient and improvement in their quality of life. So let's now discuss the new best practice statement, improving holistic assessment of chronic wounds, which was introduced earlier this year in, in 2018. The best practice statement, improving holistic assessment of chronic wounds, was developed by a group of highly skilled um, and knowledgeable um, clinicians uh, and academics throughout the UK. Their main objective or overall objective was support you healthcare professionals to improve the assessment of patients with chronic wounds. They wanted to explain the value and importance of chronic wounds within this document. They wanted also to describe the key principles underlining that holistic wound assessment and summarise those in best practice statements and those statements run throughout the document. But most importantly to me, in addition to each of those statements, it was accompanied by a patient e expectation statement. So basically, the patient knows what to expect um, regarding high quality wound assessment and management. And it then allows the patient to become involved. It allows the patient to become empowered and support, in, and support themselves in the management of their wounds. So what, what or how is improving holistic assessment? I've just discussed that with you. I've already um, discussed the, 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 the importance of the whole patient should incorporate the components of a generic wound assessment. We need, it will help us to identify factors that require intervention. Those factors may not necessarily be related to the wound. They may be related to the patient's lifestyle. The patient may work. The patient may be unable to elevate limbs if, we, if that is something we're suggesting to reduce edema. So it helps us to work and set clear objectives, not only for the management, but to assist the patient also. Practitioners, as I have said, should have sufficient time to perform that holistic wound assessment and, and sufficient, sufficient skills. When? When, do we, when is it important to carry out that holistic assessment of chronic wounds? Certainly in the community, it's recommended that patients with a wound should receive holistic wound assessment on presentation. In acute settings, this should be within six hours of admission for one of more nights or on development of the wound. What I will say is also holistic reassessment should be undertaken if the wound should deteriorate. How, what, why and when? So how we can do that and what it does is it gives us an appropriate treatment regime for our patients by highlighting the objectives that we need to meet. It helps us to diagnose and remember what I said about the, the burden of wound care. Many of our wounds are lacking a diagnosis. If we find the underlying cause or we can relate to the underlying cause, that will aid our decision making and clinical practice. And then we can implement the relevant and appropriate and best evidence treatments. 
It will also, by carrying out an holistic assessment, enable easy reviews of previous assessments. It will help us to have continuity of care for our patients um, throughout the wound healing process. And also, let's not forget, provide very good legal evidence of care undertaken. How we do that is, as I have already discussed, we need that really good general information about the patient's health, the patient's medication, polypharmacy. We need really good wound baseline information, which I'm going to talk through with you uh, further on in this presentation. We need good assessment perimeters. We need to look at wound symptoms. But also we need to be aware of any specialist referrals and investigations. But these are just the basic general wound healing and wound assessment perimeters. There may be additional assessment perimeters necessary. For example, patient with a diabetic foot ulcer, we need to build in those additional diabetic assessment perimeters around the general holistic assessment as well. What I like about this document is the communication within it. The communication to empower and engage patients. And I feel this is really a very, very strong way to go to assist our patients' wounds to heal. Let's not forget, we assist as practitioners in facilitating wound healing. Our patients' bodies, our patients' conditions will allow that wound to heal. It is very much a team approach. So it's important to discuss with the patient the impact of that wound, what worries them about their wound, using open-ended questions such as how does your wound affect you daily? How does it affect your personal relationships? That might, might not seem important when we're discussing what wound dressing, wound cleansing or compression therapy may be in use, but that is important with the mental health well-being for our patient with a wound. By engaging and understanding the patient and their wound, will help them to enlist their support in helping them to manage their wound to heal. For instance, this patient that you can see in the slide was the patient who presented following amputation. He's a diabetic patient who had two, two toes amputated due to infection. I can carry out a holistic assessment of the wound, looking at perimeters such as the wound size, the wound bed, the depth but I need to equally and most importantly understand how the wound is affecting this patient. I may assess myself that this limb or foot requires pressure relief, but how will that impact on this patient who cares for his wife, who is the main carer who, has, who is constantly 10 hours a day on his feet? How is that going to help him if we don't try and compromise or look at ways of offloading some pressure to this foot area and allowing him to carry on caring for his wife, or introducing even some care support network for this gentleman to enable his, his foot um, to have some pressure relief, or him to have some pressure relief, should I say, and allow his wound to heal. It's not only about the wound itself. We must assess each wound individually. The best practice recognises that, and I'm sure you do as well in practice. Each wound is unique. Each wound can have a different etiology. Each wound may have different objectives that we need to meet. So it's the physical characteristics of that wound that we really need to assess. Location as the wound is important. We should record accurately where that wound is, where on the body. Use the same language, use the language that's appropriate and pertinent. I know in, in clinical practice, I work in the community, that sometimes it's very difficult to see the same patient with a wound in the same week. Therefore, we all, we all need to be consistent and have that approach of documentation and accurate location of the wound. If not, it may be misconstrued that the patient has developed a new wound or the existing wound is deteriorated. Photography, we welcome this particularly in our remote areas of Shropshire. It's, it's recommended, it is now recognised as really good practice in assessing wounds and monitoring wounds and reassessing wounds. Of course, follow your local policies, follow a patient, uh, appropriate patient consent. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here you can see on the slides about the correct terminology. Correct terminology also assists, and when you are looking at where the wound is located, it can also then lead you to ask questions around, could there be any underlying structures that are affecting this wound uh, that uh, could affect the wound healing capability? Is the wound over a bony prominence? 
could see, be some problems with where the wound lies in the sense of pressure when the patient is walking. Could it be that the wound is over an area that is difficult um, to um, prevent movement, i.e. on the arm or an elbow? It really is important not just for where the wound is located, but also to guide you with your um, treatment plans. Wound measurements are really important, and I think we are already aware of that. Wound measurement techniques need to be taught. They need to be the same for all clinicians in your care environment. Um, because it's very easy to measure a wound differently to the clinician that um, assessed the patient beforehand. So it's important we use the same technique. We should be using uh, paper rulers, disposable rulers with non-identifiable paper, paper, patient data on it. We should be measuring length, width, depth, and that measurement should be ongoing. The reason for that is it can help to look if wounds are improving or wounds are deteriorating. Also, we should address the wound bed and peri-wound skin condition. And I'll talk more about the wound bed and uh, exudate in a moment. But certainly surrounding skin, as you can see on the slide in front of you, the larger wound with this, the maceration or the whitening around the, the edge of that wound is indicating that there may be some issues with the peri-wound skin damage. That may be due to exudate levels or viscosity. It may be due to the dressing regime in place. But again, it's using those assessing techniques that act as triggers to help you to look at the monitoring and reassessment. By assessing the wound consistently and continually, and all clinicians carrying out that consistent assessment, um, we can easily, hopefully, recognise and prevent wounds from deteriorating or patients becoming medically unwell. For instance, the two slides in front of you are patients with uh, infection to the lower limb. If we can recognise and get and assist our patients and carers in recognising the e early triggers and signs and symptoms of wound infection, how much better to prevent limbs becoming infected like this and patients becoming systemically unwell, sometimes requiring hospital admission, sometimes requiring IV antibiotics and unfortunately sometimes leading to sepsis which we really do wish to avoid. Wound bed, as you can see on, the, on your image with the wound with the 100% eschar to that wound bed, it is very difficult to measure and accurately size the depth of that wound because of that eschar. But still, we need to still measure that. But equally, by noting the appearance of the wound bed can help us to set the objectives. The objective in that case would be to uh, debride or assist uh, autolysis and removal of that devitalised tissue. Exudate volume, type, viscosity is important. Exudate is a natural process of the wound healing. However, exudate that is uncontrolled and not managed can become problematical to the peri-wound skin and cause further deterioration to the wound. So consistent and holistic assessment of that is important. When we have, have assessed the patient, and we've assessed the patient's environment, and we've assessed the patient's wound and peri-wound skin and surrounding skin, it's important that with the patient, we set out those objectives for the treatment. And the objectives need to be smart. We need to impl implement them in the care plan. And by smart, smart we mean specific. Include what are the expect expected outcomes make sure those expected outcomes are realistic. Who is responsible for them? Both the patient and the clinician. And what is expected from that? They need to be measurable outcomes. You know, specifically cl clear criteria for the outcome. So for instance, the wound with the 100% eschar, the measurable outcome is to remove devitalised tissue. But let's look at time on that and giving a specific time objective. They need to be achievable, as said, they need to be realistic. So the patient with that 100% eschar wound, it, it, it's, it's not uh, realistic to set an objective for wound healing at that point. What's more achievable is to ensure debridement of the necrotic tissue or eschar. That is more re realistic and more achievable at that point. It needs to be relevant and appropriate and, as, as I've said, timely. And objectives should be given a date 
So we should set objective dates to be achieved and review that. Um, it's very easy to set objectives and then not review them. As the wound moves along the healing continuum, these objectives will change and the care planning and treatment implementation will change also. For instance, um, a patient who has uncontrolled diabetes set that objective and in that care plan we will put about improving the, the the objective is to improve the control of the diabetes and that may be educating the patient a little bit more around blood glucose control it may be referring to a wider multidisciplinary team such as the diabetic specialist nurse there are always different objectives but always make sure you have clear objectives and they can be achieved as, as part of the holistic assessment, it's important to add intermediate reviews at each dressing change. I often get asked in practice, how often do we assess a wound joy? My answer to that is you assess wounds or review wounds at each dressing change. Not only are you assessing the wound, you're assessing the patient also. Have there been any changes within that patient's condition? If the patient has felt unwell, if the patient's blood glucose are unstable, is that impeding wound healing or is that actually due to the deterioration of the wound? So it's really important that not only are the wounds reviewed, but so is the patient and the patient's environment in case anything is changed. We tend to use the uh, key points of improved, deteriorated, unchanged. And this will help us to then review a deep dressing change. For instance, this patient's limb, as you can see from the images, has significantly improved with the current regime. But that doesn't mean we become complacent. We have to then continue, continue to reassess that wound and the patient. We may adjust that regime. That patient may have been on an antimicrobial therapy that has now um, uh, d reduced bacterial burden and certainly helped the wound to move along. Okay, do we discontinue now that antimicrobial therapy? I would say yes, because it's no longer necessary. So we will set more objectives and, and change the treatment plan. Again, with discussion with the patients, because some patients do insist on carrying on a wound treatment plan because it is working. Okay, so we need to educate them that we no longer need that antimicrobial therapy. Um, the wound bed is nice and clean. It's showing granulation. It's decreasing in size. Uh, again, working with them. We may describe the wound as deteriorating. And at that point, most certainly would there be a, a reassessment, holistic reassessment of the patient and the wound. And that should trigger then any key points. There'll be a medical review of that patient, as you can see in this image of this patient, with a very edematous limb, an extensive circumferential wound, edematous foot with extensive maceration and the peri-wound edges. You can imagine how painful that is for the patient. You can imagine how debilitating it is for that patient's life when the wound is constantly leaking, soiling clothing, can't wear appropriate footwear, and significant pain. So here again, that holistic reassessment of the patient to review the treatment plan and implement new treatment regime. But the wound may be unchanged, as you can see in this, in, in this patient's image. Um, two weeks following, the wound is unchanged. It's neither improved, it's neither deteriorated. Okay? But it will make you challenge, as a clinician, your assessment. Do we continue on that current regime until next dressing change or or until the next scheduled holistic reassessment. Again, that is something that normally, from my personal point of view, we discuss as a team. We actually bring the images back and we discuss and say, shall we carry on with this treatment regime? Again, discussing with the patient. Is it necessary, is it not? So these can actually be a little bit more difficult than those are actually improving or deteriorating also. So that holistic wound assessment, how, how frequently should we reassess a wound? Again, I've told you I've been asked that. I think you, you uh, observe and assess a wound every time you see a wound and the patient, but from a full holistic wound reassessment, I would say that really at least every two weeks, okay, and on discharge into the acute settings, from the acute setting, sorry, and at least every four weeks in primary care and community settings. But what I will say is that holistic wound reassessment, no matter where the patient care is being delivered, certainly should be carried out sooner if the wound deteriorates. The components, as I have already uh, discussed, of holistic reassessment is the general 
uh, health state of the patient, the comorbidities, any changes in medication? Are they undergoing any changes in, in treatments, such as some patients may be undergoing radiotherapy treatment? That may impact or could considerably impact on wound healing. Um, you know, so address that. Look at all elements of that generic wound assessment again, the wound size, the reduction in wound size, using percentages to help to, um, to look at percentage because sometimes wound reduction can be uh, minimal and very difficult without measurements. Certainly your patient's symptoms will help to look at if things are improving or deteriorating, such as pain, odour, leaking, swelling, and determine reasons for that non-healing. Why is this wound non-healing? It could be something that, that is not wound-related. For example, I had a patient recently whose wound was moving really well along the healing continuum. However, it suddenly started to deteriorate. There was a reassessment, holistic reassessment of the wound, and nothing really changed from the perimeters of the wound care. But the patient had recently be become unwell with a chest infection. They are linked because, remember what I said, it's the patient's body that will heal uh, and facilitate wound healing. If the patient is unwell for other factors or have other fact infections within the body, that will affect the wound he healing capability. So again, bearing that in mind. And updating those objectives frequently. Make sure those objectives are timely, they're updated frequently, and the plan of care is updated. And it's realistic. It's realistic and the goals can be achieved. And what I find important and what certainly assist, assisted me as a clinical lead is documenting the, the healing outcomes for your patients and the objectives. Did we meet those? Okay. That is beneficial, of course, for patients. It's beneficial for us from a staff morale. It's really wonderful when we, we help the patient to heal their wounds. But also, a service delivery, share those good healing outcomes. Share the objectives with your organisation. If, on the opposite scale, we have some poor healing outcomes because of lack of resources, because of lack of time, Use that evidence, use that evidence to challenge in practice where you need that increased time, increased facilities or equipment to carry out that holistic assessment. It can work in your favour also. And using telecommunication is important in the best practice. And this is something we use a lot in Shropshire because we're a very small tissue viability team and we cover a very large geographical area. So we want um, to, to enable specialist advice or just general good advice to improve patients' uh, wound healing and give clinicians advice quickly and, and as, as cost effectively as we can. So we use telemedicine a lot. We use photographs and imagings. I know some of our de dermatology departments use uh, Skype and other consultations. What I will say is use that in line with your local policies um, and take account uh, issues of patient confidentiality. But what I will say, it really is effective and it's far better than waiting two weeks to see a specialist if you can get advice remotely within 24 hours. Improvement assessment of wounds, I'm going to end finally with a patient story because this is what it's about. It's about the patient and making changes and best practice for them. CASE is, a, um, is an acronym. It's a, a holistic approach for, approach for better wound healing outcomes. Um, and I'm going to talk you through CASE in one of my patients and that has been produced by BSN. So this is one of my patients that presented at clinic and the top wound image that you can see. So I used CASE as an acronym um, to assess this patient and carry out that holistic assessment of the patient. So if we look at the C, which is cause, what is the cause of this wound? Remember what we're saying at the beginning, we really do need that underlying etiology, even if that cause is, is related to trauma. Because if there's trauma and, and, and the wound is failing to heal, could it be that there is some underlying foreign body within that wound from the trauma? So you can see how it goes back to the cause of the wound. With this patient, it was trauma, but the lady equally had underlying venous disease. You can see there the, 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 the changes which I'll talk to you about the assessment. So I established the cause of that wound. I then looked at the assessment of the patient and the wound. Okay, she had venous disease. She had clinical signs of lipodermatosclerosis. She got the hemosiderin staining, ankle flare, varicose veins, and the contributory factors towards venous disease. 
She'd had this ulcer for two years. So already in my assessment of the patient and the wound, I'm looking at the chronicity of that wound. She is a patient who had Crohn's disease, so due to underlying comorbidities, I was starting to think about whether she was on any medication for a Crohn's disease that could impact on the wound healing process. They may be immunosuppressive drugs, they may be anti-inflammatory drugs, but again, those are good indicators to me that might affect the wound healing process. She was a 72-year-old lady who, again, like similar to the other patient, is a carer for her husband. So again, lots of dependent edema, lots of edema because this lady was a very busy lady and very much worked from morning till night. Her symptoms though, her signs and symptoms and impact on her quality of life was just as important to assess. She was in a great deal of pain, um, high, high heavy exuding volume, uh, which caused her embarrassment. She was constantly changing her clothes and her socks and her footwear. So the impact there just even on a financial burden, but mostly embarrassment. The, the wounds on occasion, she told me, smelt, which again made her reluctant to go into uh, social environments, such as even just going to the general shop to collect groceries. Um, she felt very low, very tired and very depressed but not through what we would think, well, that's because she's busy and a main carer. She loved caring for her husband. She was, this was due to the chronicity and the longevity of this wound and the impact. So then I looked at SELECT, which is selecting how are we going to manage uh, this wound, not just the wound, the skin and the environment. So we looked at time, time being tissue, infection, moisture and edge. So for tissue, we needed to debride the slough and prepare that wound bed. And we did that with the, the debridement pads. Washing and cleansing of the skin was important and applying good emollients for that skin care. We used an antimicrobial dressing and the objective was for two weeks in review because they did look as if there was some element of local infection also associated with the pain. We used a superabsorbent secondary dressing to ensure there was a good moisture balance and taking the exudate away from the wound bed and certainly implemented compression therapy. All of that was done with the patient's agreement, agreement of objectives and understanding because I'm not saying this lady welcomed with open arms the, the thoughts of compression and other factors, but by explaining to her how the compression would aid venous return, reduce the swelling to her leg, and in time reduce pain, she was more receptive to accepting that treatment. And as you can see, how considerably in only a matter of weeks, the wounds went on, the wound went on to considerably reduce and heal. But it doesn't end there. The final bit is looking at the evaluation. The evaluation, as you can see through that process of those three wound images, is constant reassessment evaluation as the best practice recommends. Is the wound improving? Is it deteriorating as it remained the same? Do we continue with that dressing regime? Do we discontinue? What is the rationale? Can we then go from compression bandaging and give her a better quality of life and go into compression hosiery kits? Yes, we did. She felt that she was more normal with the hosiery kits. She could implement some element of self-care herself and not depend, be dependent on attending clinic appointments. That in the long term has considerable impact on the clinician's time and organisation's time as well. But we didn't just stop with healing, we look at prevention. So we looked at long term compression hosiery, we looked at long term skin management and age is, not, age is irrelevant here. We then considered potential vascular surgery for the varicose veins, which would be the decision of the vascular consultant. So in summary, improving assessment of wounds is I on the national agenda, I agree with that, and it will be for the foreseeable future. Yes, maybe around the wound care sequence, but for me, for the patients. We have already got data and more current data being released as we speak about the number of patients living with chronic wounds and the impacts on their lives. And I feel now is the right time and, and the most important time that we must improve that holistic assessment of the chronic wounds. By ensuring we listen to the patient, and we bear in mind the patient's uh, assessment, their physical, emotional and socio-economic factors, we will get it right.
We know we're in challenging times and we know there's a huge financial cost of wound care. But there is evidence, strong evidence, that that can be improved by using a structured framework that incorporates holistic assessment. That's the end of my presentation. There is further three education though in training because this is an hour session. Training is ongoing. And that free education and training is available via BSN's Medical Education Academy. There's numerous modules, but some related to tonight's presentation are around factors affecting wound healing, infection management, um, litigation and law, which again is important. But again, I would advise you to look at those modules and work through those modules. We'll now move on to our real-time question and answer session. Oh, that's an interesting one. Right, okay. How do comorbidities impact on wound healing? A very, very good question because, again, we've had 45 minutes of this presentation tonight and uh, those that know me know I could talk a lot longer than 45 minutes. Comorbidities, how can they impact on wound healing? Let's give you some examples. Um, for instance, um, a patient has um, significant... Uh, cardiac problems, uh, may have had history of an MI, uh, myocardial infarction. How can that impact on a wound healing? So if I then I'm assessing that patient and that patient has a wound on the lower limb and I'm carrying that holistic assessment uh, uh, myself, if I'm looking at the comorbidities of heart failure, I will start thinking this patient might be at a higher risk of peripheral vascular disease in the lower limb. I'm not saying that that will be the case, but again, that holistic assessment will allow me to look at Doppler readings, perfusion, toe pressures, which will help me to look at certain comorbidities that may impede the wound healing. Other conditions, if our patients, I just talked about uh, inflammatory bowel disorders, if our patients have an inflammatory disease, and maybe taking medications or undergoing therapy to uh, address that disease, such as immunosuppressive drugs, again, that will slow and impede wound healing. It does not mean the wound can't heal. It means that we need to discuss that with the patient and with any other medical consultants involved. Not to stop the treatment, but maybe to look at adjusting the treatment dosage. So comorbidities various, but all can have a significant impact on wound healing, um, but really, really relevant question. Also, I've got another one here. So this is what we call about live Facebook, isn't it? You talk about holistic assessment and the importance of making time to do it properly. Oh, how do we actually achieve this with the time constraints we have? Absolutely, really valuable question. I have time constraints, we all do. What I will say is, I'll give you a scenario. The lady I presented who had a wound for two years, okay? Looking back in notes, because, you know, we're all busy, everybody's busy. If we'd undertaken a full, say, an hour, given that lady an hour, or given the clinician the time, actually, is the important bit. It's not that the clinician doesn't want to do the holistic assessment, it's the time. So let's say we facilitate that time for our clinician to have the luxury of an hour to assess that patient and the wound. Okay, We can unpick so many uh, uh, related problems to that holistic assessment, which then means we then achieve really good, clear healing um, objectives or, or wound improvement objectives. We can implement them and then hopefully achieve them. So sometimes we have to make time to save time because then that two-year history of that patient, as you can see, after a matter of 12, 14, 16 weeks, the wound can be healed or significantly improved. And that will save time and certainly improve your patient's quality of life. So, hold on. How come the API was 8.4? I thought the normal range is 0.8 to 1.3, or is this a different way of recording? I think whoever's, oh, I can't see who asks these questions, but brilliant, because you've got us on there. It's actually 0.8. Um, so that was actually a typo in the slide. So I can't really answer more than that. So it's a good idea to involve patients more in self-care. However, some patients can't understand this. Many elderly and many uh, many are elderly and may be cognitive cognitive impaired. These seem to be the people we keep on caseloads for a long time. What more can we do to help? Yeah, again, another. All of these questions are really, really valuable. Um, 
I would say I think it's uh, the interpretation, particularly amongst the elderly population, of what is expected of us as healthcare providers. Uh, for instance, I was a district nurse for many years, and I work with many district nurses, and it is elderly assumptions that uh, you're a district nurse, you come to me, you carry out the wound care, I don't have to do anything, and we have to start and change that mindset, and, and the mindset of, you know, that you, we are all involved, and it, it's just as important for you to be involved in your wound care. Very frequently I will give advice and I've seen my colleagues, district nurses, practice nurses give advice to a patient. Um, you know, they'll, they'll give advice about the wound healing process and then talk to the patient about uh, weight reduction, cessation of smoking, reduction of alcohol intake. But the patients don't associate that with wound healing, so actually we'll ignore that. And there's no easy answer other than to keep reiterating and reinforcing um, how, how that uh, may come about. What I will say of patients with cognitive or, or some elderly patients who are unable to self-care, self-care isn't forced on patients. Self-care is for those that are able. But self-care doesn't have to come from the patient alone. It could be educating and supporting a partner a husband, a sibling, or a, a daughter, or a son. It could be um, engaged in, with a carer, a private carer, about delivering that care. So, you know, that self-care model can look various different ways, dependent on the needs of the patients. I agree with reassuring, I agree with reassessing, sorry, with each dressing, but surely not measuring with each dressing change. We tend to measure weekly, what's your opinion? Yeah, I'm sorry if that came across that I am suggesting that you measure the wound at each dressing change. We normally suggest every two weeks, um, or if the wound should significantly deteriorate, then yes, we would measure at that point. But normally in community, we say every two weeks for measurements, um, and photography probably every, um, uh, two to four normally I will, if I'm being honest it's every four weeks or again um, sooner if something significantly changes testing me today as a newly qualified nurse I have been I have been told taking down dressings every time sometimes dis disturbs the healing process what's your opinion yeah don't take dressings down unnecessarily I agree However, dressing regime, i.e. timely dressing regimes, are according to the holistic assessment of the wound. So, dressing regimes or frequency is dependent on the amount of exudate, um, or the level of exudate, should I say, um, any strike through within the dressings, and any skin care or wound debridement that requires to be done. So, you know, I can't say that every wound should be dressed every week. Every wound, as we've just said, is individual, should be holistically assessed individually. However, I will say a very healthy, granulating, minimally exuding wound. Um, yeah, be realistic on your dressing changes. They should not need to be changed every day or every two days. Again, it's subjective. I can't tell you that without assessing that patient's wound. But yes, if you do not need to disturb that wound dressing or the wound itself, then don't. How often should a wound be seen by a trained member of staff? I think that's a really pertinent question. Um, skill mix, um, demands of um, registered nurses. We're already seeing that in our locality. It's very difficult at the moment to recruit into community nursing for, uh, to, to get registered general nurses. I'm not sure if that's the case where you work. I think we've got to get out that way of thinking registered general nurses can only see a wound, okay, or assess a wound. I think initial assessment, yes, has to be by a knowledgeable, competent and skilled practitioner. The practitioner has been given that knowledge and skills to undertake that assessment. If, for instance, um, you're working in a clinic situation and we have lots of assistant practitioners and healthcare support workers who do tremendous wound care within our environment, um, I would say that, that that wound should be assessed by a trained member of staff um, if the wound should deteriorate or if the staff needs to discuss any considerations or changes in the objectives. Um, but I will say we're now having to look further into the future about skilling up wound care practitioners to have those skills to undertake that uh, um, reassessment and assessment as well. How often do you doppler a patient who has no ulcers but wears compression socking? Gold standard, I would say, from our clinical practice, if we've had a patient with no ulcers, 
resin compression hosiery, I would say annually. Um, they should, and it's not just about the Doppler, we'll emphasize that. The, the ABPI or the Doppler reading is important. We need to undertake that, but it's the whole assessment again of the limb, perfusion, uh, supply, the skin, the patient's hosiery, is it, is it fit for purpose? Are they carrying out their skin care? Is the hosiery required changing in size or class? Is the changes in etiology of the blood supply or arterial supply, should I say? But I would say generally every year. I struggle with photos, doesn't depict the exact wound any advice some really good tips in the best practice statement and I will ask you to look, you know direct you to that about good photography and I think it is difficult um, I can't go into details of the best um, camera or phone to take them on um, I know in our community um, we we do use our works phones with a very very strict criteria um, and policy in that um, but what I would say is ideally you should take an image with a measurement guide in there, um, so a paper measurement guide, take one from distance to show the location of the wound and one more uh, close up to show the, the actual wound bed itself. I think if you're struggling with um, you know, the image itself and how you can address that, we again in our organisation have a, a, a member of our IT team that actually trains us how to take a good photograph, how to record it, how to store it, how to delete it and those sorts of policies um, but I think I think taking a, a photograph is like you say it's not easy you you do need guidance on that but photography can help in, in, in great means not only through reassessment and assessment team discussions teaching all those factors and helping your patients you know showing a patient an image of a wound of their wound saying this is improving look you know can help them to become more concordant with their treatment if there are issues with that so hopefully that helps. What does the acronym TIME mean? TIME. Um, TIME is, as it says, an acronym. It's a tool that assists you in helping to look at the barriers to wound healing and helping you to remove those barriers. So TIME means these things. T is tissue. So I'm assessing a wound, and I think sometimes I should have this tattooed on my forehead because every time I look at a wound, in my head, I'm already saying this. It's in my documentation. It's in my electronic patient records. But I just say it when I look at the patient in my head, time. So I then look at T. T is tissue. I look at the wound bed. What is that tissue like? Is it non-viable? So the wound with the, the, the leathery escar, we need to remove that, i.e. that's a barrier to wound healing. So that's the T. I is for infection or um, inflammation. Is there any signs and symptoms of infection there or localised infection or spreading infection? What objectives do I need to put in place to deal with that? How am I going to, you know, could it be antimicrobial therapy? Could it be debri regular debridement to reduce the micro burden of the microbiology burden of that wound? Um, same with tissue, we need to debride that devitalised tissue. The M is for moisture, so moisture, i.e. Uh, not just exudate, but any moisture surrounding that wound. How do we manage that moisture? We don't want a dry wound, but we equally don't want the wound to become heavily uh, uh, macerated or surrounding skin macerated. So we've got to get that good moisture balance. If there is a high level of moisture, why is that? Could there be an increase in micro uh, bacteria and, and, and other um, organisms there? And the E is for edge, edge of the wound. So I'm then going to assess the edge of the wound. Are there any areas in that wound or the edge that are undermining or tunneling? Um, is there any problem, you know, because if there are any undermined edges or tunneling, is my wound dressing going to, con uh, to uh, enable it to lie within that contour of that undermining or, or wound edge? So that's important when selecting the dressings. Um, if, if there's an undermined edge, we've got to ensure that there are no sinuses or tracking. Um, so that's what TIME stands for. It's an acronym to help you to assess and, and manage and remove the barriers of wound healing. How do you effectively deal with patient non-compliance and deterioration of a wound? Gosh, that is a hard one. And I'm sure all of you uh, what, um, watching this evening can relate to that. I think when I hear the word non-compliance or non-concordance, I then say, well, why? Why is that patient 
or decision making non-compliant. So for instance, the patient's non-compliant with compression therapy. I do ask the question why. So for instance, I'll give you an example. Patient, uh, I had a referral, the patient's in compression bandaging. Phone call, the patient's non-compliant, she keeps removing the compression bandaging, we've tried every form of compression bandaging, uh, she won't wear compression, she's got venous disease, the wound's deteriorating. I then visit the patient with the clinician and it's using those open-ended questions again and it's using that dialogue as recommended in the BPS. Why are you removing your compression bandaging? I find it too tight. So the nurses listened to that, so they tried a different form of bandaging, okay? Still find it too tight, okay? It's too restricting. So then we have to look, they've got to put every other option into the patient. So the patient, we might deem, needs the bandaging, but she isn't going to wear the compression bandaging. So can we give her an alternative form of compression? That may be in the form of a hosiery kit, it may be in the form of a ready wrap system. So what can we give? What can we offer differently? It might be, in our clinical opinion, not the gold standard or ideal. But if that's going to work for the patient and she's then concordant with that form of compression, then that's going to work for her. And I do, I do you know, totally, you know, 20, 23 years in specialising, 34 years in nursing, I can totally relate to that. But I always think the majority of patients who we say are non-compliant, non-concordant, there is an underlying element to that. And you may not get to that underlying element for six weeks, three months, and then she'll suddenly, the patient may share that with you, why they are non-concordant. What is the issue? I had one lady who absolutely every time her wound, her leg also was beginning to heal on a really good treatment regime, the nurses would ring me up and say, she stopped it again. She stopped that treatment regime and wants to go back to basics as soon as the wound was beginning to show improvement. We spoke with the lady and it took a long time and a lot of confidence. It's building up that patient uh, clinician relationship and that takes time. And she finally admitted, and somewhat it may sound bizarre to you, but she finally admitted that she'd had lots of experience of her family members having leg ulcers. Her sister died with a leg ulcer, she explained to me. And she was of, this, of the mindset, through whatever reason, who she'd listened to or her family, that if her ulcer healed, she would die. Because her ulcer, and the opening to her ulcer, was a way of releasing any toxins and, and, and poisons from her body. Now that sounds totally bizarre. That is real life. That is what that patient understood. That is what that patient believed. So we have to change that mindset and work with her. And we did, and it took time. And I'm not saying there's a magic answer, but again, I am a still a strong believer that there are reasons why. And it could be that um, you know, we've, we've not explored other options, or we have, or there is still that element, there's some underlying fear of that wound actually healing. So my final question, um, uh, how can we manage patients with high, le high levels of exudate, bi bilateral leg wounds due to comorbidities, be despite consistent holistic assessments, which we've talked about, non-compliant due to the patient's mental health, and other specialist uh, input and support. We've tried everything and it just does not work. And what a final question for me to end on. Um, well, you are doing, as you said, consistent holistic, is, holistic assessments. Um, the patient's got mental health issues and I think that that exactly uh, speaks volumes a little bit. I have a few patients with similar issues and what I do do is work with my mental health team. And I'm sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not being uh, derogatory here uh, to whoever asked that question. I'm sure you've already done that. Um, but I will work with my mental health specialist. I'm not mental health trained. And I think a lot of the issues are around that. And we have to work together with that patient and the mental health team. It's not a magic fix. I'm not saying that. Um, I think whether we can bring in that family members, um, uh, sorry, that patient's family members that might help them to concord or to accept 
the, the care again I'm sure you've been down that pathway um, and I think again thinking outside the boxes it may not be uh, the, the gold standard but all the other treatment regimes we can put in that the patient will accept um, that might help the wound to heal and I'd like to take this opportunity huge thanks to BSN Medical for supporting this event um, BSN have a, a wide range of wound assessment tools and the contact details will be on the screen I hope this has helped you gain a better understanding of holistic wound assessment. Thank you and good night.